I want to thank you so much for your attention. Um, if anybody has any questions, we have a few minutes remaining where I will um, answer questions. I see there's a couple already. Um, so we'll go ahead and, um, and start going through those, but feel free to keep, keep adding them if you have any other ones. So um, our first question is, are you using vacuum assisted biopsy device and what is the, the gauge? So for our, um, at our institution, for our ultrasound guided biopsies, we do not use vacuum assisted biopsy device. For our um, stereotactic or tomosynthesis guided biopsies, we do use a vacuum assisted biopsy device um, and it's a, a, a nine gauge needle. For our ultrasound guided biopsies, we typically use a 14, sometimes an 18 gauge biopsy device. Um, the next question is, um, did you try Hydromark clip after stereo biopsy and did you notice migration? Um, so that's a, a great question. So we use Hydromark clips for our ultrasound guided biopsies. Um, we really like it, especially for um, cases that we need to localize in the future. So the Hydromark clips are really well seen on ultrasound. Um, we do not use them right now for stereotactic biopsy or for MRI guided biopsy. Um, there is was concern about migration. I know I think our, our rep has said that the, the newer ones have, have less migration, but I will say right now we are not using those. We're using other, other types of clips. Um, although our, I think that there is benefits to those hydromark clips to allow that because it would allow us to be able to do localizations um, uh, using ultrasound potentially, especially for really deep findings. So one of the questions here is, is it fair to say that most beneficial of DBT is architectural distortion? Um, I would say that the, the benefits of, of DBT are really twofold. So one is identifying more cancers and those are often architectural distortions, but they may be developing asymmetries um, as well. Even masses that are uh, obscured by the surrounding breast tissue can be better seen with tomosynthesis. Um, and but I, I think that that category of improved cancer detection is definitely a benefit of DBT. And part of that is arterial to distortion, but I don't think all of it. I think another benefit of DBT, however, is the decreased recall rate. And I showed a few, I showed a few cases um, where um, we could see that the that um, by using tomosynthesis, we were able to clarify that a finding that looked possibly suspicious on a 2D mammogram really just represented normal overlapping breast tissue. The next question is, I have struggled to stereo a deep calcification in the um, lower inner quadrant, any tips? So deep um, findings are, are challenging sometimes with um, stereotactic biopsies. There's definitely a lot of positioning um, tips. Uh, I think it's, it's, you know, sometimes you can try to have the, the patient put their arm through the table if you're in a prone um, position. And sometimes it'll allow it to get further back. I would, um, try both the CC and lateral view sometimes to try to get further back. Um, if we're very lucky that we have uh, multiple sites and some of our sites have a prone table and some have an upright table. And I find that that there are some cases where one or the other can help me get further back in a to get a, a, a lesion. Um, but it is a challenge sometimes to get those really posterior, posterior calcifications. Um, sometimes it's just not possible. And we've definitely had cases where we are unable to do a biopsy and we will instead of localize it and the patient will go straight to surgery, but we really try to try to minimize that. Um, the next question is, um, what do you specifically write in the tomosynthesis report? Is it different from the mammogram report? Um, we have a, a, a line that we include in our mammogram report stating that tomosynthesis was used as part of the exam. It's just a one line that's added to the, the mammogram um, report. The next question is, do you have the facility to place a TOMO guided clip without doing a biopsy? Um, so I guess the question is, do we have the facility? I mean, technically we would be able to do that. We have, um, I think done that on very rare occasions, um, but that is done very infrequently. Our surgeons have a strong preference to have the pathology before taking the patient to surgery. Um, so we haven't found a need to, to place um, clips without doing a biopsy on, on very many occasions. We would, um, usually do the biopsy and then place a clip there so that we would have an answer and um, and know what the pathology was before, um, before a patient goes to surgery. 
Um, then the next question is, um, is there a scenario where stereotactic biopsy is superior to tomosynthesis guided biopsy? I currently only do 3D biopsy, but was wondering in which scenario to consider 2D biopsy. So I, I you know, I, I showed, I think that I've been really switching to doing more and uh, like to doing just about all of my calcification biopsies, even with um, tomosynthesis, because I feel like it's, I can do the biopsy quicker. Um, and I'm taking fewer images, but I will say that there are, there are some calcifications that are kind of subtle, like some of those more amorphous calcifications where I feel like the 2D images help me see the finding better. And in those cases, I, I might do a 2D biopsy. Um, I think it's also helpful to have both possibilities. So it's, it's um, you know, sometimes I'll go back and forth where maybe I'll do my scout image with 3D, but then my pre-image I'll want to do as a stereotactic pair in order to better see the calcifications if I feel like they're somewhat obscured after giving the, the numbing medicine. Um, I haven't done a full case using just stereotactic in a, in a while, but I will say I will definitely take stereotactic images to help me sometimes for, um, especially for subtle calcifications. Um, the next question is, do you use tomosynthesis regularly for every case or in a few selected? So um, we use, um, so for screening exams, we would like to use it for all patients, but unfortunately there are a few insurance companies still in um, the state of Maryland that don't cover tomosynthesis. So we do about 90% of our screening mammograms with tomosynthesis, um, but that has increased um, over the past decade um, dramatically, but we're kind of right around, we've been 90% now for the last few years. However, when we call patients back, we do we um, do tomosynthesis for all of those recalled mammograms, unless they're for calcifications when, when it's not necessary, but um, we uh, do all of the callback mammograms with tomosynthesis because we find it to be very helpful in order to, to limit our, our need for biopsies for findings that we could clearly see are, are just overlapping tissue with the tomosynthesis. Um, our next case, our next question is, um, how many cases in your, in your study had a normal study on tomo biopsy? Um, so I think you're referring to the, the architectural distortion paper and the developing asymmetry paper. So, um, so all of those patients had an ultrasound exam that was negative. Um, all of them had a a finding on their on their three d mammogram that was considered suspicious and and had a biopsy done. and in both of those studies, twenty percent of them turned out to be about twenty percent turned out to be cancer. So the eighty the other the other cases were not were not cancers. Um, so it's still the majority of those cases did not turn out to be cancers, but twenty percent is a is a high enough number to definitely justify doing a biopsy for them. You know, we usually BIRAS four is anything over a two percent risk of breast cancer. So when we're talking about a a pre uh, a predictive value of twenty percent, then that um, easily justifies biopsying those findings. Um, the next question is any tips for biopsy in a small breast? And yeah, this can be, can be challenging. You know, we have the petite needle, which usually you can, um, it, it will allow you to do a biopsy up to, I think it's um, 2.3 centimeters of thickness, but there are definitely patients who have um, even smaller breasts. And there are some things that um, you can do to, to help you. So um, you can uh, give lots of numbing medicine to kind of create a little bit more breast tissue um, to use, there is um, when when doing the when you're localizing, you can remember that you're going to be taking. Um, you're not you don't have to exactly click on the finding when you're doing the biopsy. You can click in front of it or behind it in order to allow your whole um, the the biopsy needle to be buried and have instead of the finding being exactly in the middle of your of your target, it could be towards the beginning or the end, and that can be helpful to help to get the needle totally buried. Um, on top of there being, you know, our normal needle, and then there's a petite needle. There's also a blunt tip needle that can be used for very small, small breasts. So you have to obviously have to get order that and have it separately, but that's another option to be used for small breasts. Um, I think also another, another thing that I found helpful is being able to go back and forth between the, the CC and the lateral view. Sometimes one, a patient will compress differently in one view versus the other, and it might be a little bit thicker in one view to help you do the biopsy. The next question is, which do you suggest, tomosynthesis or contrast enhanced mammography? And I'm, I'm very biased because we do not do contrast enhanced mammography at uh, my institution. So I would definitely pick tomosynthesis. 
I also don't think it's one or the other. Um, I think they are both, you know, I think pieces that, that use contrast enhanced mammography are also doing tomosynthesis. Um, I think that tomosynthesis has a lot more data behind it um, and is a more universal modality than contrast enhanced mammography if you're only gonna have one or the other. Um, but there's a lot of exciting uh, research coming out on contrast mammography. So I'm excited to kind of see where that where that goes and where that's gonna fit into our, uh, our cancer workup. The next question is whether we have increased detection of microcalcifications. I assume that is referring to with tomosynthesis and I, and I don't think so. I don't know that calcifications necessarily have improved detection. Uh, I think that the benefits of tomosynthesis are more specific for invasive micro, uh, invasive carcinomas, which are, are usually not just calcifications. Um, but I think that the, there have been studies that have sh shown both, um, both for that. So I don't, I don't know all of the data off the top of my head, but I would say the benefit of tomosynthesis is not necessarily for increased detection of microcalcifications, but more for um, like masses and distortions and asymmetries, like I talked about before. Um, so, you know, the next question is whether there's an absolute indication for tomosynthesis. And, and no, I don't think the answer, right? You know, currently standard of care is, is either 2D or standard full field digital mammogram or tomosynthesis. So um, we do think that there is, there is sufficient studies to say that tomosynthesis is um, that has improved recall rate and cancer detection. Um, but the standard of care is really for either modality, and it's much more important for a patient to get a mammogram with either one than to not get one, um, to, than to not get one or to choose one or the other. So I would definitely encourage patients to get a screening mammogram. Um, and if it, they can get it with tomosynthesis, I would always pick that, but I would not say that there is an absolute indication for that. The next one is how do you encounter complications, bleeding during or after the biopsy? How do you handle it? So, you know, whenever we're doing a biopsy, there is definitely a risk for um, for bleeding. Um, that's probably the most common complication that we that is the most common complication we see. And you know, I I find that holding pressure is is almost always is gonna is gonna be successful. Sometimes it's a lot of pressure and for a long time. Um, and if that is the radiologist, or maybe there is a tech or tech aid at the institution that can help, um, but really holding firm, continuous pressure until the bleeding stops. You know, there are rare complications, like pseudoaneurysms that can occur. I think that's really one-offs, but most of the time the bleeding really just requires um, pressure, continuous pressure um, until it stops bleeding. The next question is how much local anesthetic do you give and how often does the target move? Um, I, I do think this is sort of individual. Uh, you know, I think even when I did my my fellowship, which is only a few years ago, different the different attendings that I worked with would be definitely inconsistent with how much anesthetic each person used. But I found that the most important thing is is making sure that the skin is really well numbed. So um, I want to give enough uh, lidocaine in the skin to make sure I see a really a, a skin wheel that's very clear. So it's usually about um, one to two cc's, you know, sometimes if, um, if I end up, if I, my initial injection is a little bit deep, I'm not seeing a good wheel. I'll put a little bit more in. Um, and then I give deeper numbing medicine, lidocaine mixed with epinephrine. Um, I usually draw up about eight cc's and, uh, depending on how, um, how dense the breast tissue is and how deep the finding is, I'll just slowly inject it in and out and usually give about five or six cc's, but it is, it is very variable. Um, I, I find that with that patients do not have symptoms typically during the biopsy, but I do tell them if you're feeling anything, let me know. We can always give you more. We, um, our biopsy machine will automatically give additional lidocaine as we're taking the biopsy samples. Um, so I usually will warn the patient. They might feel like a, a, a few seconds of that singing sensation when we're taking the biopsies. And that's probably the numbing medicine that's, um, that's going to be, that's at an area that wasn't totally numb. Um, not the biopsy needle, like causing, causing pain. And I think that um, is very helpful for the patients to know. Um, the next question is, do you have any data of DBT guided biopsy with implants versus stereo? I don't have any data. I think it would be interesting to see, um, you know, I think with both, you want to make sure that that implant is really pushed back as much as possible and is not in the, the images. Um, I think um, I, I, just kind of anecdotally, I, I like using tomosynthesis because I think I can really scroll through the slices and see for sure that I'm not going to hit the BM anywhere near the, the implant, which is with the, with the, um, angled images that sometimes it can be a little bit confusing of 
of exactly the direction that your needle's going. Whereas with the tomosynthesis, you know, you're just going straight down through the breast tissue. Um, but I don't have any, any specific data on that. I think it would be an interesting, interesting thing to look at. Um, the next question is, does needle localization ever helpful in lesions with suspicious calcifications? I'm not sure I completely understand that question, but we do need a localization for suspicious calcifications. Um, I don't, we don't typically use um, tomosynthesis for our localizations. We usually do them with a aponumeric grid. Um, but I think I know there's other institutions that are using tomosynthesis more for localizations. That's not something that I'm, I'm actually that familiar with. And the next question is, in our unit, the clip placement has to be through the biopsy needle. So on the rare occasion when we need to place a tomo-guided clip without a biopsy, we do not have the equipment to support this. Which equipment do you use to facilitate tomo-guided clip placement? So I think this is probably maybe a follow-up to the question before asking if we ever placed biopsies with, or biopsy clips without doing the biopsy. I also, I'm not sure that we have a separate equipment. I'm not sure. There may be things that you can order. I think the very few times that we've done this before, we probably had to just open up the biopsy, the whole biopsy kit, but I'm, I'm not actually hundred percent sure. Um, I think it's something that you could ask your, your rep about if they would be able to separate and just get the, um, the biopsy, uh, like the introducer piece. Um, but you would need to have a needle in it to get to the site. So I, I'm not sure um, what you would need to do, but I think it's something probably to talk more with your rep about. I don't think that we have anything specific that we have different. I think we've just opened up the biopsy kit. The, the last question is, how do you biopsy lesions close to the skin? Um, it's, you know, a, sort of a similar answer, I think, to like how to biopsy in small breasts. And, it, and I would say it can be really challenging. It can be really challenging. Um, it could be helpful to use the petite device. Um, but if there's a lot of tissue behind, you might not need the, the petite device. I think a few things that you can do are to make a really big skin wheel that can add some additional depth, um, for you to have, to get the needle totally buried. You can also target slightly past where the lesion is on your stereotactic images, knowing that your where you're targeting is going to be the middle of your biopsy device you don't necessarily need the lesion to be right in the middle. It's okay if it's closer to the proximal part of the needle. So if you target slightly past it, you can still um, often biopsy the lesion closer to the skin. Um, so those are some tricks that I've done to try to get these very superficial biopsies. Um, but I do, I, I know they can be definitely be challenging. Um, well, thank you so much for the, for the discussion.